Good afternoon, legacy viewers. Uh, reporting from Matilda, Warner Bre Beach, uh, Moth Shoal, uh, 3 2 Battalion organized a wonderful get together of all units. And today, my guest is Don Brown. Um, as you can see from his, his shirt, uh, he used to jump out of airplanes. Um, <laughs> so, welcome, Don. And uh, if you can. Tell us a bit about you and a bit about your time in the military, etc. Okay, um, called up to 3 Sci in 1974. Um, wasn't there for long, but the paramedics came around and uh, I succeeded in doing what they wanted, wanted me to do and was good enough to get on there. Can't, can't remember how we got to Bloemfontein, but that's probably by train. Did the para training. Um, night we, we after training we went up to the border. We were at uh, Rundu for a while, Fire Force. Not much was happening there. Everything was happening towards the Caprivi. Um, the next year I did two years. The next year we went up to we were posted at Itali base. Itali is a little base about 15 k's north, uh, south of Oshi. I think yeah. the place is. Yeah. Santa Clara on that Santa Clara is across the border, yeah. Uh, when we got there, our commanding officer was Himan, Major Himan, a wonderful Sergeant Major we had at the time. Um, he's still very much part of us, and just there the name goes. Um, I'll get to it now. Um, and we were there, we were helping the police look after the border. At that stage, there was a a um, vote, what do you call it? A, the Portuguese had a had an election, yeah. and the communists took over. And basically, overnight, they told their colonies, "Get out! You're free!" And army, come back to Portugal or disband. Which obviously left the Portuguese citizens or the Angolan citizens in, in a pickle. There was a many, many, many atrocities. It was suddenly all these groups had freedom to kill as they wanted to, which they did. Um, and uh, next thing, MPLA was on the border. Um, UNITA had taken one side of the town, MPLA the other side of the town. And they regularly used to fight across the main street or wherever they found themselves. And um, we used to stand our side of the border and it was basically a little fence. And we'd have these conversations with them and at some stage an MPLA, I think it was a captain, came to us and said, listen, tonight we're going to rev, or oh, no, you didn't use the name rev, that's our name, but we're going to attack UNITA across, across the main street. But we're not looking for trouble from you. Um, we let the Major know, I was at the little police station then, we let Major Liman know that there's going to be some action there. And we had our little mortar pit trained on the barracks, which is a bit further off from the, the, the actual border. And um, we stood a lot around there like spectators. One platoon of um, C Company, uh, one parachute battalion. And the fun started, sort of shooting each other. And we were keen to get involved, you know. You, yeah got your training and you want to do something but it's not our fight. Unfortunately one of their mortars fell on our side and I'm quite sure it was accidental. They didn't want to, they were busy with their own thing. But uh, one of the chaps standing near me lost his eye, a piece of shrapnel took his eye out and that was, I mean, let's shoot back. So we started shooting back, just popping a few mortars Got on the radio, told Major Himon that we um, we're in a contact across the border, and there's a lot of gunfire, and he heard it in the background. So he said, "Hang on, I'm bringing the rest of the company up. Wait for me. Don't cross the border." So a few minutes later, quite a lot because he had to mobilise everybody. Three Panzer cars, little noddy cars of the 60 mortar, and the other I think were four platoons. So the other three platoons came up in a hurry with our Unimog, still the old Unimog in those days. And we deployed, and as we were deploying, Major Himan was giving orders. 
platoon orders and we made a skirmish line and we went across and we were part of the war. And um, we went sweep through, a few people were killed. On the other side, we had no casualties. Swept back, consolidated, and uh, the decision was what then? We've taken Santa Clara, do we let Oshikangi even know we've yeah. taken Santa Clara? And um, I remember him on saying to me, I was then uh, information, yeah? Inlichtingskoppera. I was an inlichtingskoppera. And he said to me, Brown, where's the next cell? I said, 10K is up, sir, this is more or less what it, I did my homework. This is what it looks like, most of the buildings are along the road. And I cannot remember if it was the next morning or a day or two later, he said to his loots, tell us how we're going to attack this place. And all these loots got together and they said, well, stop the groups there and stop the groups there. And um, main will come from the north so they don't expect us. And I just saw him on, he had his own plans. He was a bit of a Napoleon character, or him on. He says, no guys, come. What we do, Brown, how long is this town? I said, it's about a kilometer as far as I can figure along the main road. He says, my Gary will be in front. I want a noddy car, three um, Unimogs, another noddy car. We stretch out to about a kilometer, and when I start shooting, you shoot. And off we went <laughs> into this little town, and he told us to shout. Viva Angola and shout all their slogans as we're going up. So this is what we did. Viva Angola, Viva Angola. And we driving up the main streets and it's early in the morning. And these guys are still coming out with their, with their breakfast in their hands, looking at this procession going past. And of course, as soon as we got to the other end, we started opening up and there was a, a lovely firefight. And um, that that's basically the story I wanted to tell. And that that was... I know there were other things happening at Ruakana and maybe somebody else went in somewhere, but that was my start to Operation Savannah. And from there, what happened is we were taken back to uh, south of the border, we consolidated, then the whole military gear got into motion. The next town was then Pereira Des, which yeah, we know as yeah. Ojiba. And um, our same company went in, we were the main fire force going into Achiever. Uh, I have a feeling somebody had passed through again, maybe in being the wreckings, but it was still occupied. We still had motorbikes in the, in the shops. To do. But we, it, it was chaos. Um, and yeah, then the whole Op Savannah got into swing and General, uh, Colonel Breitenbach took the old FNLA up the coastal road and I think it was Dalvin Linford took the Bushman up the other line. It was 3-1, wasn't it? 3-1, yeah. And that, but that was the start for me of yeah. Observant. All right, and then, uh, yeah, I, I was back the last of July. All right. Yeah. So we actually spent the night in Oshikango. I, okay. took, I took HP and Fear, mm -hmm. and then Paul Lowe was the platoon oh, right. commander yes, yes, yes. in the same ride with HP as the driver. Um, yeah, I don't think. Um, Santa Clara, I don't think you've got a separate village now. Ten goes down the road. Really? Is it so down. developed? Eh? Yeah, and uh, it's busy, busy, busy. You know, well, that's the tragedy of, of, of Angola. Yeah. That for 27 years, they, uh, I don't know if one can get political about it, but outside forces were manipulating the NPLA and you need to fight each other while the, the, the resources were being raped. I'm so glad to hear it's developed now. Yeah, um, yeah, that's great. Uh, because obviously you come from Namibia where you drive on the, on the one side oh, of the road right, and you yes. cross over. But as you come into Santa Clara, there's this huge traffic circle as you come over the border post. All oh, right. And, and that, that was the most confusing thing because now you're driving on the other side of the road and you've got to yield to the left instead of yielding to the right. All oh, right. Um, and of course, diesel and petrol are so cheap there. But the queues to get there, to get in, to get to a petrol station, oh, to get to petrol station. because all the Namibians are going across with tank, oh. tanks and taking. Oh, right. Yeah. So we then went actually from we went to the the smoke hole site, 
Mm. So we went to uh, Santa Clara and Jiva, and then we went off to the oh, right. right to Anjiva. Yeah. Anjiva was a big city today, mm. and I think it was a fairly small town. I it, was, it was. It was. Um, uh, it was an interesting. It was an interesting attack that we did on Jiva. Let me just tell you. So I was walking behind. I think we had airlines by then. But I was walking behind one of the airlines as we were doing the attack. And I saw a window open here and an RPG come out and it went off. It hit the back of the airline, but it hadn't activated it and shot into the air and exploded somewhere up there. And when we got to the end, I pulled the driver out of his airline and I said, you know what that was? RPG. <laughs> it went white. <laughs> And, and then as far as Savannah is concerned, what, what happened? Okay, so we were about to claw up. Okay. Um, so we stayed there, I think we were about five days. We, stay, we stayed in Jeep for a long time, had a lot of fights with MPs because the bikes we took out of the showroom were stronger than theirs and they wanted to take our bikes away. So we in, in disgust all drove the bikes onto a big pile and poured petrol over it and set it alight. We were in big trouble. But uh, no, the, the sheriff wasn't happy with us. But we stayed there a long time, um, not much action. Uh, I think they were gearing up. Yeah. I, I think at that stage, UNITA became part of what we were doing, uh, but yeah. more importantly, um, by that stage, the ANS had asked us to try and get ethanol A. It wasn't only the ANS, it was the Nigerians, Zaireans, a lot of African countries didn't want MPLA. Yeah. And they actually asked us to, I don't know if we want to go on with it. Well, it's up to you. Okay. I don't know if, if, if um, well, in any case, they, they, and this is all you get later, you don't know it then. We were asked to go in um, and try and get on Agustino Net, not, not then, Julie, what was the uh, ethanol A leader, Holden Rebecca. No, we were asked to make, go and help make him president um, and chase the. MPLA, MPLA right. communist art. UNITA was more a southern group, as far as I understood, a Jamba area, and he, was, he had his role to play. And um, I heard later that the, the agreement with Americans was that, because Forster had said to them, we don't have artillery to take a city like Luanda. And the Americans promised us, us the artillery if we go up. And I was chatting to one of the guys earlier at the meeting. He was uh, the next para battalion a group came in and the Kasinga happened and all those things happened and there was a small group I think they called them the orange group with the ethanol A soldiers in Brayton got, got very close to the land at that. and that is when everything changed because I hope no CIA guy decides <laughs> that I'm giving info I shouldn't but bad luck to them the story goes that when we had surrounded Luan, we cut off their water, we cut off the electricity, their food supply, I mean, not we, the guys that went after we, I clawed out by then. Um, the Americans got in, went to see Agustino Neto, they gave him a document, not this, it's a piece of paper, it was a map of Angola, it had grids drawn over it, and the Americans said, sign that document, and tomorrow the South Africans were drawn. And what it was, was a document with oil concessions. Shell, BP, blah, 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 blah. Sign this tomorrow, the South Africans pull out. Your oil for $6 a barrel. That's it. And they had to. So they signed it. Whether it's rumor or not, I believe it happened. The next morning, apparently, in the New York Times, big advert, uh, Ford horrified. South African mercenaries in Gola warns Foster to withdraw. Yeah, politics, turn politics, around, and go back home. <laughs> politics, politics, and politics. So. Yeah, but we, yeah. yeah. And, and once you clawed out, did you have to do any more camps or anything like no, that? No, I didn't because I was one of the first groups that did the two year. Okay, instead of doing. And they gave me 3,000 bucks and I walked to the closest Toyota sales. Bought myself a GSL to pay 2000 for 299, no, 2999 rand and drove home to, from Bloemfontein. But subsequent, um, I heard of Bravo Group and 3 2, and 
I went and studied and for a few years, never did camps. And then I met a mad dude who was an engineer type fellow that was on his way to the border. He needed a place to sleep. I'm not going to make it a long story, but he told me all about the three two battalion. And um, that was just before Ops. What's that there? Big Ops? Um, yeah, right uh, there. 81, beginning 81. 81 was Protea. Protea, the Big Ops. Just before. He was there. The, the guys were coming from all over the world. The street you had a bit of a foreign contingency. Yes, yeah. And uh, there was a Frenchman that slept in my place that night. He wanted to teach me how to fight with a knife. I teach you to fight with a knife. So don't worry, we'll just relax. <laughs> you, you, you don't have to teach me, you can stay here. And I got so excited, I went to my German employer, Siemens, and said, I'm out of here. And long story short, I'm going to get now. I ended up on a plane, flew to Rundu, and joined. It's a bit of a story, but it's a, it's a whole different thing. I ended up at 3 to Battalion, just too late for Protea. And I spent 81, half of 81, half of 82 at 3 to Battalion. And it was very interesting. It was an amazing place. Very, very different. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So you would have got out just before Mia Boss. Uh, no, no. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. No, I was in Mia Boss. Oh, you I was in part of Mia Boss. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, in fact, let me tell you what happened. And, and um, I'll tell you the 3 2 story that I was mentioned earlier. So, um, we used to operate only in Angola. We never operated south of the border. Um, our troops were all black. Um, so we were normally 24 black guys with two whites um, in the platoon, the platoon sergeant, platoon commander, and we'd go and spend six weeks anything from across the border to 200 k's behind the enemy lines, um, basically destabilizing the southern Angola. Um, and looking for swap, looking for plan. But we used to do it in such a way that we, we tried to, we were pseudo goops, camouflage, um, AK 47s, the whites in the platoon, all, all black was beautiful, uh, not all the time, but especially if you're going to go into an attack, you do. Uh, most amazing troops, most amazing troops. What made 3-2, according to James Defence Weekly, the best infantry unit in the world is because of the simple fact that those guys were troops for 27 years. And, and I suppose, you know, I often think that if you're defending your own country, it probably, what I'm saying is a bit more... Uh, yes, they were, yeah, yeah. Or no, fighting for your own country. No, they, were, they were. They were. You know, I, I often wonder. It, it must have been. I'm talking now about our position, but it's been tough for a Cuban to come over to Angola. It's not his country that he's come to fight for. You know, uh, there's not that loyalty or national pride or whatever. You know, we. I can tell you that we never got our group never got to them. But I spoke to guys that were involved. We almost felt sorry for the Cubans. They arrived here, they weren't sure what they were doing in Africa, and they literally died by the thousands. Yeah. And, and, and it wasn't their cause. It wasn't their cause. It, it wasn't their cause. Um, later on, of course, they acclimatized and, and they got used to it. I actually read a book some Russian uh, signal or translator wrote. He says, in Angola when he was there, in southern Angola, he faced the enemy. You need to, you fight. If you hear the South African army is there, you rather just withdraw. When they hear the terrible ones were there, three two, you throw down your weapons and <laughs> run fast. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I suppose you know the training was specified for that yeah. purpose. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you a story that will explain the difference between 3-2 and Parabas training, so I've done both, obviously. In, in the Parabas, when you get dropped by helicopter, you go into 
Front on to the other circular defense. Once the helicopter's out, you get into your V formation with your two scouts and you move because you've compromised your position to the enemy. So you move. 3-2 bat uh, battalion training was very strict, but it was always the, the command on the ground that would adapt it to the situation. And um, often what the guys would do when the helicopter dropped us off, of course the whites were black and beautiful, you would go into right there where you dropped, you'd go into uh, your all around defense and you dig your trenches, but you'll have a contingent of your guys that behave like swapping. So you'll take your shirt off, hang it over a tree, your AK-47 down the road at the tree, you are well, further away, you, you must look just like incompetent. Yeah. And let's see who comes to have a look. And invite them closer. Ideally, you want to get them there and tell them that you are lost swapper stick and Butchel's direction to the base. But if they weren't cooperative, quick fire fight and that, so that's the, the difference between the two training. Yeah, I think also the fact that you're operating in relatively small groups, you've got a lot of flexibility. You don't have some captain or colonels dictating the rules. Uh, yeah, um, and we did some fairly conventional things as well, but 3-2 in general, rank was, was of no consequence. Um, but just to finish off on the troops, so I said the troops were, troops were 27 years. In the normal army, you'd be a troop for a few years, corporal, yeah. sergeant, staff, and off you go for higher ranks. When you're doing the same thing for 27 years, and you've had mates die around you, you know what to do to survive. And that's what made them good, that's the one side. The other side of it, if they did not fight to, to the degree that they did, and they lost their white leadership, they were lost. They were stuck in Angola. They were never trained to be leaders. Well, so not only that, they were never trained of how to get, they would have... Gone the wrong direction, who knows? They, no, look, I, I think yeah. they would have made it some, yeah. but it was, it was the whites on the radio that, that called the helicopters in yeah. for resupply or for transportation back. So they, were, they treated us almost like gods. Uh, they would die for us. They, if we got wounded in an attack, You'd have three, four coming into the arc of fire just to try and pull us out. But there was a certain loyalty as well. Um, three, two, and, and this is the heart of apartheid. But I mean, you, you, you slept in the bush with them, never for a moment doubted their loyalty. But in terms of the training, um, I'm gonna tell you a story that was a very sad day for three, two battalion. Um, we were doing an ops about 100 k's north of of the border, not not exactly, but more or less, sort of directly north of of the operational area on the Kaplan. Um, I think maybe towards Kahama. I'm not sure. Um, and the idea was that the paravacs would be dropped off at point A, and they would patrol south and just occupy the area, show a presence, and do patrols. Three to battalion was going to be well, forgot, would be dropped off one kilometer north and operate north. The Air Force switched the RV of the grid references. They dropped 32 south and Parabat north. And 32 went into their thing, they went into their ground defense thinking that they're north. They put their heavy equipment north, their PKMs, we had quite, we had serious Russian yeah. stuff. Russian weapons, best. Trust the AK, not, if I'm, if I'm shooting in the bush, R1 can go through trees, fine. Bit of dust, stop shooting. AK-47 just rattles on. And the PKM the same, brilliant weapon. So, um, we know the Parabats are south, no, not we, it was A Company um, Alpha 1, and the Tomo Thompson, and their, um, Sergeant, uh, the platoon sergeant was James Conroy. Lovely guys. Tom Thompson, stinking rich lad. He could have been in Switzerland, but he wanted to do the Rechte Engelsman. 
you know, a real Englishman that really wanted to do his thing for the country. Uh, but there he was in Fiji. He was the sergeant, of one uh, uh, commander, and James Conroy was one of those, although Conroy sounds um, English, I think he was a Scotsman actually, and I, and I wouldn't be surprised if his forefathers fought with the Buddha against the English. He was that sort of Scotsman. Lovely young man, full of life, big guy. Um, any case, they were now at their point. They set up their machinery to face north. In the meantime, the Air Force had dropped the bats north of them, and the bats became sus on their compass, deformation, scouts. And next thing, um, the Twitter guys see these guys coming straight for them. So Tomo says to the guys, take out yellow smoke. Because yellow smoke on the border means own forces. The enemy didn't have yellow smoke. Unfortunately, and we took, the guys took out their smoke, and he said to his troops, do not shoot back. If anything happens, do not shoot back. And of course these bats came, and I was in the bats. Found, boy, you gung ho, eh? And next thing they see this, because they, they saw the guy standing there without his shirt on, with his AK, came into attack formation and started shooting. And people were getting wounded, people were getting shot up. A lot of the guys were in trenches. You just, a little slip trench. Yeah. So it wasn't easy to shoot them, fortunately. They seen their mates dying around them, well, getting shot up at least. The PKM gunner, I spoke to him later, I'll tell you how that happened. He was lying, lining the ferrobats up with his PKM, just keeping his fingers straight. And eventually, what saved the day was James Conroy realized that as these guys get closer, people are going to really start getting injured. So he jumped up, because now he's got black and beautiful. And he ripped open his, his, shirt. his shirt and almost instantly, uh, M79 grenade hit him on the chest and blew him apart. Just before he shouted, Ayamachte, own forces. Um, and that saved the day. Um, but he was dead. Yeah. He was blown to pieces. Was he the only casualty in terms of death? Only death. And, and it, it was his death that saved the rest of his guys. And, and the parabats immediately realized, of course the smoke was going, but you're gung ho. You know, the yellow smoke was all over. But you're gung ho. And, but it's, that stopped the attack when uh, James was blown to bits. And um, yeah, that perfectly demonstrates different training methods, but it, it, it is a perfect example of a blue on blue attack, meaning the same forces attack, and on a simple little misunderstanding of where the drop zones were, which is, um, but fortunately only one. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's an unfortunate thing, I suppose. I don't think you can have any war without the odd thing going wrong, you know, and, and obviously today technology is so much better. And, oh, uh, and, you know, you just have a GPS and you know exactly where you yeah, are. Absolutely. And you're most probably in communication. I mean, if we, yeah. if, 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 so what happened, why I know so much of it is, when James was killed, um, I was asked to take over as platoon sergeant in his platoon, and I spoke to Tomo and he explained his side of how, how it actually happened in, the, in headquarters, how the grid references were changed. He doesn't know, I don't know, except that next thing the bat happened, yeah. <laughs> coming from. <coughs> Yeah. And, and uh, uh, James, such a lovely, one of those clean-faced, cherry-cheeked young men, you know. Yeah, so what I'll do, um, I'll actually try and send you some photos of um, Santa Clara that we took last oh, yeah, year. Please do. Thank Just you. out of interest. So I'll send you some of what it was. In fact, yeah. I think I may have on that phone. Yeah. I'll and then, um, yeah, I'll, I'll maybe try and look up some information on James Conroy and we can just put a little rest in peace. Into the video as well. Oh, that would be great. Sure. I may even have Tomo Thompson. Okay. He, he's the type of guy that, I mean, wonderful. It was wonderful spending that time in the bush with him. Next year, he was skiing in Switzerland because 
because he could. He could. <laughs> Stake me well, with. No, he didn't. <laughs> no, absolutely. Oh, no, well, that's that's great. Uh, any, you've basically done. You know, yeah, no, 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 yeah, I don't want to take it. Yeah, what time. what sort of rank did you finish up uh, with? Staff sergeant. Staff sergeant. Yeah. Okay. Well, I did the, the national service and then short yeah, service. Okay, yeah. I remember when I tied out um, Falcon uh, Brigadier Ferreira said to me, "You'll be back." I said, "Brigadier, I see these old men doing short-term type services. No, that's not my life." Cheers. No, and well, that was it. Yeah, well, Don, it's been great chatting to you. Thanks Thank very you. much for for chatting to us and for the legacy viewers out there uh, till we meet again.